National Prayer Breakfast. President Joe Biden speaks out against political extremism, why some Catholics criticize his comments. Capitol Hill concerns, how Republicans are making a pro-life push while wrestling with problems in their own party. International Day of Human Fraternity. Watch our report from Rome to learn what it means for you. And live audience, when Pope Francis will resume appearances in St. Peter's Square. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Joe Biden tells the National Prayer Breakfast that the nation still has many difficult nights to endure and that faith will guide us. But the president of Catholic vote is not impressed by the president's words. This comes as President Biden announces a new plan to help more refugees enter the United States. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening. The National Prayer Breakfast, not to be confused with the National Catholic prayer breakfast. It features multiple denominations and faiths. And today, President Joe Biden talked about racial justice, climate change, the pandemic, and the recent violence at the Capitol. Now, he said, for many people in our nation, this is a dark time, but he said we can't be timid or tired. President Joe Biden quoted scripture and discussed faith during today's national prayer breakfast. The Bible tells us weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. We need to lean on one another, lift one another up, and with faith guide us through the darkness into the light. But Brian Birch, president of Catholic Vote, writes, quote, President Biden's brief, unremarkable address ignored the aggressive and hostile steps already taken by his administration against people of faith, including the anti-science transgender mandate and the deeply unpopular decision to fund abortion around the world. President Biden does not speak for Catholics or the church. It's not the first time a president has been criticized for what he said at the prayer breakfast. At last year's event, President Donald Trump slammed his political opponents. When they impeach you for nothing, uh, then you're supposed to like them. It's not easy, folks. Meanwhile, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says President Joe Biden wants to reassert America's values. The president in the first two weeks has reversed the Muslim ban the ban on transgender service members serving in our military. And the president wants to welcome more refugees to America. To uh, build up a more robust capacity for the United States to accept refugees from around the world. The president's plan would increase the cap on the number of refugees allowed into the U.S. to 125,000. He spoke about his foreign policy goals during a visit to the State Department this afternoon. Today, I'm approving an executive order to begin the hard work of restoring our refugee admissions program to help meet the unprecedented global need. It's going to take time to rebuild. Also tonight, the war in Yemen. In his speech at the State Department today, the president said it has to end, calling it a humanitarian and strategic catastrophe, and he wants to use diplomacy to end the many years of fighting there. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Republican senators make new efforts to fight for life. Senator Josh Hawley has called on President Biden to reinstate the Mexico City policy. Meanwhile, Democrats are calling for the ouster of a Republican lawmaker. Correspondent Mark Irons has the latest. Mark. Tracy, Democrats want to remove Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene from her House committee assignments. They condemn the Georgia lawmakers' embrace of far-right conspiracy theories. And over in the Senate, Republicans have a message for the president. Missouri Republican Senator Josh Hawley says the president should reinstate the pro-life Mexico City policy. He writes, your administration's effort to compel American taxpayers to fund foreign organizations working to snuff out the lives of unborn children around the world is an affront to their most deeply held beliefs. And yesterday, Senator Joni Ernst called on her Democratic colleagues to protect life at all stages. I welcome my pro-choice colleagues to join us in this effort and take a step towards unity. I believe once you focus the heart and mind to approach life as more than just a policy issue, you will find that preserving life promotes unity. 
On the House side, there's a fight to remove some lawmakers from office. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she remains profoundly concerned about House Republican leadership's acceptance of extreme conspiracy theorists. Particularly disturbing is their eagerness to reward a QAnon adherent, a 9-11 truther, a harasser of child survivors of school shootings. Georgia Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has suggested that school shootings were staged, voiced support for the QAnon conspiracy theory, and once said black people are held slaves to the Democratic Party. Republicans have weighed in, too. She gives conservatism a bad name at a time when our country needs conservative viewpoints more than ever. But today, Congresswoman Green says she feels remorse for her past comments. I was allowed to believe things that weren't true, and I would ask questions, questions about them and talk about them. And that is absolutely what I regret. And Congresswoman Liz Cheney survived a call to be removed from a top leadership role in the House following her vote to impeach President Trump. 61 members of her party voted by secret ballot to remove her from her post, while 145 voted to keep her one voted present. At the Capitol, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Abortion advocates and left-wing lawmakers have launched an initiative to legalize abortion in Poland. They are seeking enough signatures to make abortion legal until the 12th week of pregnancy. Last week, the country imposed a near-total ban on abortion. The government wants to create more hospitals to care for pregnant women whose unborn babies face health issues. Our victims' family members demand justice following the deadly explosion that rocked Beirut last August. Investigators blame government incompetence for ignoring the safety hazard that led to that explosion. But political interference is reportedly hampering the investigation. The brother of one of the victims says that he will not give up until justice is served. Iran's president is claiming a major victory in a bid to end U.S. sanctions. <laughs> President Hassan Rouhani is applauding a ruling by the International Court of Justice. It says that it will hear Tehran's case against sanctions from the Trump administration that date from 2018. Lawmakers representing the United States has called for the case to be thrown out of the court. Cardinal Charles Bow is urging the military in Myanmar to release former civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi. The head of the Archdiocese of Yangon also called the military takeover, quote, shocking. Cardinal Bow is the first cardinal from Myanmar, also known as Burma. The Holy See at the United Nations in Geneva recently spoke at the U.N.'s Conference on Trade and Development about the fallout from the coronavirus that has taken a toll especially on the least developed countries. It was described as the worst situation in the last 40 years. We are somehow not sufficiently informed of how much the, the coronavirus is affecting the, the less developed countries. So it means that the data that we receive are insufficient. It is quite Threatening to roll back progress towards sustainable development and possibly leading to long-term damage. The Holy See calls for international help. What we have to do is to assure them effective and real monetary support in the future. So it means we have to take them seriously and help them in their needs. The Holy See said that aside from their financial needs, they seek assistance, especially in the area of technology. Our thanks to our colleague Christian Peschkin of EWTN Germany for this interview. Pope Francis will start speaking to a live audience again after Rome eases COVID restrictions. While Rome was under stricter, stricter conditions, the Holy Father's weekly talks were live streamed from inside the Vatican's library to avoid crowds. However, on Monday, Rome allowed museums and restaurants to reopen. And as a result, Pope Francis will return to giving his Sunday blessing to the faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square. Well, today marks the first ever International Day of Human Fraternity, and Pope Francis says fraternity is the new frontiers of humanity. Es la frontera, la frontera sobre la cual tenemos que construir. In the virtual celebration, the Holy Father said that we must see ourselves as brothers and sisters. Otherwise, the world will collapse. This day was inspired by Pope Francis's trip to Abu Dhabi exactly two years ago when he and the Grand Imam signed a document on human fraternity. 
Joining us now from Rome is Father Bernardo Cervellera, editor-in-chief of Asia News. Father, welcome back. So good to see you. Uh, tell us, why was the visit from Pope Francis to Abu Dhabi so important? It was important because Abu Dhabi is a very important uh, country and very rich, and with uh, a small population of Muslim people, but with a huge population of foreigners. So the Abu Dhabi would like to understand how uh, foreigners and uh, Muslim can cooperate and can coexist. So this is why the Pope going to Abu Dhabi to sign the document about uh, universal fraternity was very important for Abu Dhabi and also for the Muslim world. What sort of response has there been so far to the first World Day of Fraternity? Uh, let me say, uh, not very big, uh, big following, uh, because uh, we, we, we have seen that there is the Pope, um, Al-Tayeb, uh, the Grand Imam of uh, Al-Azhar, also the people from Abu Dhabi, and uh, some other people, a very important person, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres. Not many people, not other many people here. But uh, I would say it is important because the message which is launching, which is about coexistence be be among different cultures and different religions, is very important. Because uh, in Abu Dhabi, the Pope pushed the Muslims to op be open to the freedom of conscience, uh, to open uh, their uh, life to education, uh, and respect for other religions. So very, very important, although it is, we are still at the beginning of a process. In your opinion, how do you think this will help to build peace and dialogue between two different cultures and religions? We can see the situation now with the pandemic. Everywhere in the world we have seen uh, people of different religions helping other people of different religions. Uh, it's true, above all, Christians who help others, Muslim and Hindu. Uh, for example, people without a job, poor people, hungry people, sick people, and so on. So I think that uh, this universal fraternity in some way is working. Uh, at the level of uh, states, and uh, of big government and big uh, financial institutions perhaps uh, is more difficult because uh, we have, for example, the fight for the anti-COVID vaccine. Every country is trying to get as many vaccines as possible without caring too much to other countries around. Well, Father, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate your time and what you do. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. Coming up, deadly disease. Why COVID-19 cases in Africa are growing more troubling. And a closer look at the challenges and opportunities facing Catholic schools during the pandemic. Experts warn the number of COVID-19 fatalities in Africa are creeping higher than the global rate. I'll keep you updated. The director of the Africa CDC says his fear is that with the number of COVID-19 cases ticking up across the continent, these are beginning to become numbers rather than people. And the CDC's priority is to make sure vaccines are delivered in a timely fashion so that countries can start vaccinating. India's health ministry says the number of co active COVID-19 cases is dropping, but a large section of the country remains vulnerable. India has recorded the second highest number of COVID cases in the world after the U.S. Tests show over 21 percent of adults in the country have already been infected. India is counting on vaccines that it has already administered more than 4.5 million doses. As many school districts here in the U.S. continue to wrestle with when and how to reopen amid the coronavirus pandemic, we take a look at how Catholic schools have had success in maintaining safe in-person instruction. 
Join me now on Skype is Thomas Carroll, Superintendent of Schools for the Archdiocese of Boston. Thomas, welcome. Thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. I know that you've been able to keep your students in classrooms while many other schools across the country are teaching online or using hybrid models. Tell us, how have you been able to do it? Yeah, very simple. First of all, we decided that it was very important to get the children back in the schools. And when you believe, as we do as Catholics, that every child is created in the image and likeness of God, you simply can't accept stranding them. So as soon as the governor indicated in Massachusetts that we could reopen, our focus was on how to reopen safely, not on whether we should open. Most of the public school districts around the state were focused on whether they should even open. Most of them opened late, and they opened with remote. So we had actually, once it was clear that that's what the districts were doing, we gained more than 4,000 students. Most of those uh, students were from families where public school parents could not believe that the public schools were not offering live instruction. So we follow the protocols. We follow them, so to speak, religiously. And we found out there's a lot of things Catholic schools do well, but one of them is, even without having the nuns in the classrooms anymore, it's getting children to follow instructions. And so we have a safe, structured environment. Everybody's in nice, neat Catholic rows. Nobody's kind of breathing face to face on each other. And we found that uh, what we do normally happens to be good in the middle of a pandemic as well. So we've had virtually no cases of yeah. spread within our schools. That's incredible. Uh, I know in the Wall Street Journal this week, you were quoted as saying the science is clear that there is no substitute for in-person learning, especially for poor and minority children most at danger of falling behind. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that and the benefits of in-person learning academically and also emotionally? Yeah, we think it's very important for children to be with other children. It's very important to children to be with their teachers. And the teachers feel the same way. They want to be with the kids as well. But also the in-school environment versus the way a lot of districts are doing remote is just providing a much higher quality of education. There was a, a new book that recently come out indicating that our Catholic schools are outperforming public schools in Massachusetts, even though the public schools in Massachusetts are among the strongest in the country. I think that that separation in performance is going to be magnified by the fact that we have children in class and the public schools do not, by and large. So if you think about it in terms of large urban school districts, and this is going to be a problem with the president talking about wanting to get all the schools back in person, is the teachers' unions are stopping that in a lot of locations. But they provide uh, school lunches, they provide special education services, that's serving homeless children, and all the rest. All of those things are not being done well while the children are sitting at home. So I think it's going to cause a generational problem in which kids are not just not staying on grade level, which is hard for urban, a lot of kids in an urban environment but they're going to fall behind a significant amount. And it's going to be extremely challenging, if not impossible, to bring all those kids back up to grade level. And that's going to affect them for a very, very long time. And we believe that you know, getting kids yeah. into quality school, particularly a Catholic school, is the best ticket out of poverty for somebody in a disadvantaged family. And that ticket is being shredded in many schools. But in Catholic schools, we're keeping that commitment. Yeah, and it's so great to see, um, as you mentioned, enrollment up, too, and we hope that just continues. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thomas Carroll, Superintendent of Schools for the Archdiocese thank of Boston. Thanks again. Thanks. Up next, pro-life case in court. Why Louisiana right to life praises a judge's decision. In South Carolina, about 50 members of the public testified yesterday for or against a pro-life bill. It would mandate doctors use an ultrasound to listen for a fetal heartbeat if they think pregnant women are at least eight weeks along. The bill now goes to South Carolina's House Judiciary Committee. Governor Henry McMaster's promises to sign it if it reaches his desk. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, the chair of the Congressional Pro-Life Caucus says so far, President Joe Biden's term has been a major disappointment to pro-lifers. The unborn children of the world and in this country uh, need friends and advocates, not 
powerful adversaries. And unfortunately, President uh, Biden has set himself up as the abortion president this early in his presidency, in his tenure in office. Representative Chris Smith calls out President Biden for not defending the unborn. The Republican also shares his pro-life strategy leading to the 2022 midterm elections. That's tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly at 10 p.m. Eastern. Our pro-lifers are praising a decision by a federal judge ordering the release of documents related to the June medical services case recently before the Supreme Court. Abortion providers had fought to keep those documents under seal. In that case, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that Louisiana's Unsafe Abortion Protection Act, which required abortion doctors to have admitting privileges at nearby hospitals, was unconstitutional because it created a, quote, undue burden for women seeking abortions. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about the significance of this federal court order is Angie Thomas, Associate Director of Louisiana Right to Life. Angie, welcome back. Good to see you again. Um, what are some Thank of the kind you. of documents that you are hoping to see? You're welcome. And what are you hoping to learn from them, Angie? Yes. So, well, we don't exactly know because they've been sealed. But what we're looking for is the, you know, parts of the court record, parts of depositions, testimonials that reveal the truth of what's going on in the abortion industry. Um, in fact, one judge in an opinion in the plethora of, of uh, legal documents surrounding this case, she revealed a part of a deposition where an abortion doctor in Louisiana revealed that another abortion doctor was not even following a medical standard of care and um, subsequently live births could happen because of the way that that doctor was doing the abortions. So those are the types of things that we're going to be looking for um, in, in this unsealing of records. I know that Louisiana's attorney general is calling this, quote, a victory for transparency. That said, why was this information previously under seal? Well, we know that the abortion industry certainly has a lot to hide. Abortion thrives in that secrecy. So it was a huge win to be able to unseal these records and reveal the truth of what's going on. You know, it reminds me a lot of the tobacco industry, how big tobacco money controlled all of the information. And so what we're starting to see is a crack in their wall of secrecy. So we're very thankful for that. Well, I know uh, you and I talked shortly after the Supreme Court's decision in the June medical case about the ruling's impact on the health and safety of women. How will access, do you think, to these records help ensure their protection? Well, what, what we'd like to see is, you know, the legal academics and journalists and lawmakers are going to have access to these documents, very unique documents revealing the truth, re having actual abortionists revealing the, the things that are going on inside. And so we're going to see some good policy come out of that, hopefully. Once the truth is revealed, we'll be able to have the legislators really uh, craft new legislation that can help women and children in the future. And, you know, this case was always about the safety of women. We, it, we, it came to us as testimonials of women who were actually hurt in abortion clinics and here in Louisiana. That's why we, we brought this idea to Senator Katrina Jackson in the first place and why this law was even created. That problem still exists because, as you just said, the law was unfortunately struck down. So what we can do with these records is go back to the table and continue to fight for the safety of women and, of course, the safety of unborn children. Andrew, we have probably about a minute left, but I'm wondering, um, how do you think this is going to help in crafting some new pro-life legislation in the future? Well, like I said, I think that it's going to help the lawmakers really see the reality of what's going on in abortion clinics. And I also suspect that this may have an effect on how often the abortion industry challenges the laws that we make. If they know that these depositions of their staff members and the abortionists are going to be out there for the public to see, they might not be so inclined to challenge every single abortion regulation that's put forth here in Louisiana, but also perhaps nationwide, that that could have an effect. So we're very hopeful. Again, we just want to see all of the truth revealed about abortion. This has been a 48-year experiment on women, and we certainly know that it's not good for children, but it's also not good for women. 
Absolutely. Angie Thomas, Associate Director of Louisiana Right to Life. Thank you so much, Angie, for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless. <laughs>